What time is it? It's time for another every other Wednesday. Recording All right, in progress. Everyone, come on in. We're starting. It come is... on down. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Michael. I thought you were going to turn that shirt off. No, I turn. I'm turning it up, man. All right. Uh, yeah. Story come on. Of a lovely. Do we have a question? I, I, how about? Has anybody, yes or no, in the chat box, has anybody been through any kind of merger or acquisition? That's a great question. Careers? So tell us about it. Yeah. And I'm not and talking about marriage. That doesn't count. I was, gonna, I was just going to say, <laughs> many of us have been through a one-on-one -on -one merger. Right. There you go. Yeah. Um, so so that's, that's the question. I'm also curious, too, if people, because I don't think there was enough people, we're going to have to ask that question again as more okay. people. But I think another question, because I'm curious, because it sounds like right now there's bipolar weather everywhere. People are like freezing cold or, you know, I was going to say Arctic hot, but I guess that's not at all. No, uh, no. I'm, I'm curious what the temperature is where people are. Like, well, it is. Like Canmore is. Boy, what's your temperature? Well, uh, uh, mine's going to be in Celsius, of course. Yeah, so I, I can get mine in Celsius too. Oh, mine is zero. 32 wow. degrees 32. Mine yeah, it's, is, it's mine 65 is six, here. Mine is 16 and a half Celsius. And a half. Oh, yeah, because it's 62 Fahrenheit. Um, yeah, 55 what, what here. Are you, what are you in Pittsburgh, Jeff? 55. Oh, I thought you said 65. Okay. No, yeah, and we're, wait, we're, Jerry Gitchell has a question for you, Richard. Okay, Jerry, what what's the question? <laughs> Jerry, can we talk about this privately? Or do you, <laughs> How do many you fingers is he got? How many fingers is he holding up? <laughs> I'm holding up. You want to explain you that? the rest of the group on the uh, on the on the bit. Oh, explain my situation. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So yesterday I had cataract surgery on my left eye, and that's why I'm a little in the dark today because everything went beautifully and went fine, but my left eye is still a little dilated and letting in more light than I would like. And so I'm just not, I don't have my big studio lights on today. Right. But anyway, I can see everybody better than I have been able to in several years. And those of you who have had this, uh, this particular procedure, if your experience was the same as everybody I've talked to, uh, they say it really is, it's excellent. I mean, it's a miracle of science what they can and do. And you get to see all of us today. That's as Bob right. Friedman yeah. said, We're it's a full here. house. That's so why don't we get started? Right. Is that frightening because you can see better than you've ever seen? And to see what we actually look like, are you yeah. are you intimidated by that? And I'm still committed to staying with the group. Okay, great. Right. Right. Let's get started. Commitment. Let's get started, shall we? Richard, Let's since see. you're talking, why don't you start in, with the introduction? Okay, great. Thank you. My name's Richard Haddon, and I live in Jacksonville, Florida. That's where I am today. I'm an author and speaker, and I've written several books with the phrase Contented Cows in the title, and I talk about leadership, employee engagement, recruiting, and retention in the new world of work. Sanjay. My name is Sanjay Nath, and I am a speaker and author as well, focusing on leadership and performance, best known by a concept and a brand called the 108010 principle, which helps organizations and groups focus on their strength to achieve more. Mr. Kerr. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Kerr, coming to you from Canmore, Alberta, in the spectacular Canadian Rockies. I speak about inspiring workplace cultures. My most recent books are The Jerk-Free Workplace and The Humor Advantage. And my new book, due out perhaps maybe April, perhaps May, I don't know when, is called Small Moments, Big Outcomes. How leaders, how leaders, I should learn the title of my book, shouldn't I? How leaders, how leaders should learn the title of your book. How, how, wait, wait, wait. How leaders create cultures that drive extraordinary results. I like how we yeah. all have the speaker voice. All right, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. You fit that You fit that on the front of your book. Holy cow. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Very small font. <laughs> and last but not least, I'm Jeff Tobe coming to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I, too, am a speaker and an author. How's that? What? Uh, yeah, and I speak on customer experience and coloring outside the lines. And may I say that because none of you were here last time, I got to promote Coloring Outside the Lines, and I actually gave away free copies to a lot of our uh, PDF copies to a lot of our viewers. So okay. I'm hoping I'm they're enjoying it. Jeff, you said, you know, before you introduce yourself, last but not least. So who would be least? And more importantly, last week when you did the introductions of yourself, would you be last and least? I was last and I was least, believe me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's right. always better when we can all be here together. And today is what, Michael? February 21st, 2024, in case you lost track of the year. All right. And hey. today's topic is? 
Culture clash. Culture clash. That's yeah. right. Should we wait, wait, what, what day is, is it, Mike? It is Sticky Bun Day and Mother Language Day. To honor Mother Language Day, I'm doing this whole thing in English today, just, you know. <laughs> Very good. Good of you. Good of you. As opposed to Albertan? <laughs> As Albertan. <laughs> <laughs> I could speak Albertan. You know, speaking of culture clash, um, I find that when the four of us get together. Yeah, we are really, really getting, getting started. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you have uh, you have Ontario that stayed in Ontario, Ontario that moved to Pittsburgh. You have uh, Alberta, you have Florida, uh, you know, of all places. So, yeah, very different. So, yeah, so, that's what we, we thought we would explore this idea of when organizations we actually started this from an M and A perspective, going you know mergers and acquisitions. When all of a sudden your workforce doubles, or you know you are now part of a new team, or huge turnover, and then we, as we discussed that more, we said, wait a minute. I mean, not everyone's been through a merger and acquisition, which was what the question we asked up front, but a lot of this stuff still applies because if you're on a hiring spree and your team of six is now nine, you just increase fifty percent. Or if you take on a new job and your brand's making you an organization and you're learning the, the values and cultures and, and the way of the, of the land, uh, all of this stuff becomes really applicable. So we're looking at this from a bunch of different angles. But the idea is, yeah, what happens when the cultures clash or how do we make a seamless transition much butcher? That's the at both an individual level and, and group yeah, level, right? And, and, and yeah. would you not agree as well that even just shifting teams within the same organization, teams have different micro cultures, right? So you yeah. can go into a new team and think, holy smokes, this is not how we did things in the last team. Oh, I, and that's the classic line, isn't it? That's not how we did things. Oh. Here. And it reminds oh. me, you know, down here in the, in the southern United States where I live, uh, there is a very popular... Um, bumper sticker that many people have i do not uh have it and it says frankly my dear <laughs> we don't care how you do it up north right <laughs> and, and i think that that very same thing can can happen in in companies i i first became aware of this dynamic when i was a teenager and i worked in a branch of the public library here in jacksonville florida and we we were the biggest and the baddest and the the newest branch uh here in the area where i live and um, a guy had been had worked for several years. Again, again, another teenager had worked for several years. This is a part time job, had worked at the north side branch. And he transferred to the Regency branch, which is where oh. I worked. And I mean, within 10 minutes of him showing up there, everything was, um, you know, uh, well, at Northside, we do this. And at Northside, <laughs> we do that. And I, So, I so typical so of those Northside people, eh? Right? <laughs> and it, that was, you know, even as a 16, 17-year-old, I thought, that is so obnoxious. And I vowed never to be one of those people uh, who did that. But Speaking, yeah, of, it, speaking it, of that's the way we've always done it, that was a good segue into yeah. something totally related. I just want to remind everybody that if you're putting notes in the in the chat, Make sure the drop down box says everyone. Richard, yours did not. So it, uh, it oh, went to gosh. just us. So just, Rob, just, Rob didn't get my. F, no, he did not. Just oh, FYI. Okay. Okay. So you guys were making fun of me in the green room, as I like to call it now, because I have That's been cool. through a merger, even though there was only four of us. But <laughs> I actually bought a little company and there were three people added to the company. And believe me, it, it doesn't matter the size. <laughs> we, we still went through you know, major cultural uh, changes. I, I think that, so one of the lessons I've learned was you have to speak a common language and you have to figure out what is that language, even though you're in the same business. Um, <laughs> like for example, they were used to one person at the top making almost all the decisions. That's not the way I manage. And that was tough. They would come to me, you know, they would, they would come to me with everything. And I'd say, just make a decision. And they go, are you sure? Because that was the culture they had. So I think that common language is really important. In fact, if you know, not to do a shameless plug, but that's actually one of the biggest advantages of bringing in a speaker or a trainer. Because sometimes it just, like you said, it gives a common language. It's not that one way is better or worse or righter or wronger. It's just that, hey, we're now on the same page. We now can express things in the same way. And that minutia is no longer holding us back and we can start building on that and, and go further. Right. 
And it, I think it also involves how do you hold people accountable, you know? Um, there, th these are all small nuances that I just remembered. Don't forget, I'm going back 30 years, but. Well, I, you know, I think the, the thing in my experience and also in, in what I've read is what so often happens is a failure to plan for cultural <laughs> integration. We're just not, uh, they're not prepared for it. They're, they're not thinking about it because the people who are uh, engineering the merger or the acquisition, they're not thinking about culture. I mean, they do now because we're a little bit more enlightened than we were before. But, you know, one of the classic failures uh, in terms of a merger and acquisition and cultural Im uh, immigration, cultural integration was um, Time Warner AOL. I mean, I became aware of that, and that was back in the 1990s, that, you know, the whole thing just fizzled and, and flopped. Uh, and not because the products were not, uh, the services were not compatible. So much was compatible. Financially, they were compatible. There was so much that worked really well. But it was a culture clash, and therefore, it ultimately failed. And in fact, much of what I've read has said that about 75 to as high as 80% of organizational mergers fail and that is almost entirely because of culture. Which is different from what Mike just typed in. He said, fun fact, 30% of all mergers fail because of culture. Oh, okay. Well, see, you know, I, I'm just- No, oh, I just updated my, my- I can only see out of really well. <laughs> there we go. Or perhaps it's 75 or 80. <laughs> but, and, and here's the thing is, as we know, culture is such a ambiguous, unflowing, hard to measure idea. And yeah. there's culture in the finances. Right. The way you sure. report certain things, yeah. you know, is it, how is this inventory tallied? So there, it's pervasive in everything. And yeah, I mean, when things aren't working, when they work on paper, but they don't work in real life, that's always a culture issue. When you and forget like organizations, let's look at sports teams. You have uh, we see this all the time at the Olympic. Actually, the Olympics is a great example, considering it's 2024. So you have these superstars and pick your sport. It could be basketball. It could be hockey. It could be baseball. And you have all these amazing players and you put them on this team that's supposed to be super stacked. It's supposed to be better than an all-star team and they don't win. And they're not not winning because of talent or, you know, to draw the analogy, it's not about product or service. It's, it's, there's a lack of culture, whether it's leadership, trust, communication, all those elements that, that form it. And therefore they're not able to, you know, bring it to that next level. Well, I think when we're talking about this, there are two very distinct things. One is obviously culture. We'll talk more about that, but one's organizational as well. And I think they're, they're, those are different, but you still have to make sure that the organizational part meshes. And the cultural part, I think, is more about values and, and you know, mission, vision, values, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I think that's tougher to nail down when you're joining a company, when you're you know, bringing somebody new in. Isn't it also a lot just to, because if we say culture, one definition of culture can be how we do things around here. Um, if you do things differently in one place than in another, in one organization than another, there can be a real clash there. I mean, look what Fritz said. I got into this line of work when I got sent by CVS to help convert the newly require, uh, acquired Revco pharmacy stores into CVSs. Guess what happens? I love this. Guess what happens when a store manager from Selma, Alabama tries to get help from a support team in Woonsocket, Rhode Island? Talk about not speaking the same language. I mean, and that's clearly, I mean, that that's going to happen, you know, anywhere in, in a country as large as the U.S. And, and in Canada as well, because, I mean, wouldn't you say that there's a there's a culture difference in the Maritimes and there would be in the in the, the Western provinces and uh, the Prairie sure, provinces? For sure. So, yeah. Sure. So those things are definitely going to going to be a, a challenge. So yeah, what, that's that, that's an interesting point we haven't really touched on, right? Even just uh, different coming from different countries, coming from different regions yeah. within a country, you bring yeah. a certain mindset, a certain approach to work yeah. that uh, is potentially going to clash with a new team or a new organization. And the key is this: is the key, I think the, the the big key is to know that no matter what your opinion is, you're wrong. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Right. There, there's a there's an element of of what you're thinking that is not serving everyone, and there's an element of what you're serving of what you're thinking that is serving. And to think that you have the the be all and end all that you have the right solution and be so tunnel vision um, as an as a leader, as an organization, as a department, as a branch, as as a company is very you know short sighted and will lead to to issues. 
I mean, you so can kind of come in going, I got 50 years of experience and here's what I believe, but just because it worked for 50 years, there's a new technology and it may make it irrelevant now. So yeah. I think what we just have to do is, is create a culture of, of safety, of where people can challenge the status quo, where people can say, hey, this is how we used to do it. Is that relevant here? Or yeah, how do we take those back to the merge? Yeah. Yeah, 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 be, being That's curious. Let, let me, however, that though, Sanjay, However, comma, what happens in a situation, and I was in this situation in a lar large organization where two teams merged into one department, uh, equal size teams. Clearly though, clearly it was obvious to me, the other team and, and not my, not the team that I was originally on, the other team had a way stronger culture, a stronger sense of culture. I thought a far better culture, a far more inspiring, collaborative, psychologically safe, all those things that, that we would want in a culture. So there was clearly one team that had a far superior culture. And that happens when organizations merge too, I think sometimes. Well, they don't necessarily, it's not so much a question of bringing the best from this one and the best from this one. What happens in those situations though, where it is clear that this organization or this team or this department has an outstanding culture and they swallow up a team department organization that has a soul sucking, fun sucking culture. Well, you, you would, would think you would think that the soul sucking, fun sucking culture would be would welcome the opportunity to join an inspiring oh, culture. Maybe maybe they don't recognize. I mean, I mean, I'm saying you would think. I mean, just kind of intuitively, yeah. you would think that. But yet, if they don't see it that way, then I think what happens like is this: flash. is if you if the the good culture is dominant, right? Because you begin, and the numbers I think come into play here as well. So say there's a hundred- You would talk about numbers, Sanjay. Exactly. If there's a hundred person organization eating up this little 10 person organization, and this right. is the 10 people's the soul second culture, and the hundred is the, is the, you know, the vibrant culture. I think that you would expect this to happen. The soul second culture, some of them will kind of roll their eyes and go, fine, here we go. Let's try it. And- eventually convert because it'll be like, oh, this is actually kind of good. But the people who are closed-minded enough to not, not even want to try it will burn out and eventually leave. But like, so, they'll be like, well, this isn't what I signed up for. And they're you're going to get natural attrition. I think so that's the soul, soul suckers are 20%. The, uh, sorry, 10%. The the vibrant company is 80%. What else is left, Sanjay? There you go. They did a 10, 80, 10. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, I saw, I, we should have seen that coming. That's but, right. But I like I like what some of I like what some of our uh, friends are are adding here to the to the chat. Um, one uh, so Bob oh. Bob talks about um, uh, merger or, or you know integrating cultures being a little bit like uh, the steps of grief that you can pass through, mm -hmm. and that sometimes the organizers and those in charge are further along in the process than those in the trenches. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah. it seems to me that it would be to everyone's advantage if that is true that yeah. those who are in charge and who have kind of come along a little bit that they prepare the people who are in the trenches for that and i think a lot of it just comes down to underestimating the the absolute impact and importance of culture i think people say well i think we can we can do this it's not going to be any any big deal and i think the same thing happens when we bring somebody in from a very different culture or when we join an organization knowing that it's going to be a very different culture from where we've come from, we probably think, oh, well, we can adjust. We can, you know, we can flex with that. And it may be harder than it appears. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think is it's important to uh, to recognize that if you do this all in theory, so we, you know, Mike and I have two companies merging and and him and I sit down and go, oh, well, this is what we're going to do. And we're just going to dictate the culture mm -hmm. and not actually get input from people to hear what's important to them. It doesn't stick. I and mean, we know this about when we talked about mission and vision in the past. When you when you force it, cram it down someone's throat, it's they don't have ownership of it. And it becomes a plaque on the wall that maybe people are going to recite, but no one actually adheres to or lives by. So the more we can incorporate multiple people's voices and have that representation, of what they want the culture to look like, uh, the, you know, the, the stronger you're going to have adherence and the more you're going to get the desired culture you want. Are we, yeah. are we smoking cigars in your scenario, Sanjay? Or do we're, 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 we're wearing grosso glasses as well. That's, yeah, yeah. 
I noticed Rob said uh, somewhere in here, you know, an example of the of a great merger. Um, I, does anybody know what was dubbed the worst merger in history? Uh, I think it was called the Every Other Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> the four of us, you mean? <laughs> yeah. So Rob, did Rob um, did Rob postulate? A... No, but I want I, I got a question. You're you're not answering me. Okay, what was yeah. the what was the worst I, merger I, in history? It happened in the year two thousand. Was it uh, chocolate and peanut butter? Yeah, thanks. I, was, okay. I would have thought. I would have thought. Um, the worst uh, merger oh, oh, in oh, history. Oh. Was this like a know. royal wedding? It was. Are we talking it, business? It was. It was AOL and Time Warner. That okay? That's what I was yeah. saying earlier. Okay. AOL, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and it was like that a was two hundred billion dollar uh, merger that. You know, within a couple months, I guess the recession hit, and uh, the the whole dot com bubble burst, and it was dubbed the worst merger in history. So I don't remember any more details. I just I don't know why that stuck with me. So. Yeah. Well, well, I I think it is fair when when you go through the the literature through the history of mergers, that culture has and maybe as Richard said earlier, it is getting better now. But I think traditionally culture has not been top of mind they haven't thought about that and they didn't even consider it as an issue and it blows up in their faces because no one thought about that well yeah. so to, to go back in terms of uh talking about mergers that have got it right um and and i actually i'm more brainstorming than i am kind of going this these guys got it because i don't know the detail but i'm thinking of a few examples like for example um for a long time here, and I, I can't speak to the state, but in Canada, they had Walmarts and they put in a bunch of TD branches, TD bank ATMs, uh, which looked to be like a really good merger. It wasn't quite a merger, but it was yeah. two organizations yeah. kind of working together. An integration of services. And, and, yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's more important is integration than per se merger. Uh, another example I think of is, um, in, again, in Canada, is we have uh, Wendy's with Tim Hortons sharing the same building. Um which uh, again, there there are certain there are I mean, certain benefits and and uh, what's the word economies of scale that you would get from bringing this this together. But in order for it to fly on the scale in which it does, there has to be an organizational fit. Like the, and and does it work? Does it work? Well, there's enough of them out there that I think yeah, yeah. I think it would. I've seen them. I is it because Wendy's coffee sucks? Um, <laughs> I think that has to and be there. so did their donuts. So. That's what we call yeah, vertical yeah, their integration. Donuts are pretty bad. Those and Richard, in the states, isn't yeah. it true that every La Quinta or La Quinta hotel has a Denny's beside it? I don't know yeah, why. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't know if that's. Uh, I don't know what the uh, the uh, strategy is on that, but it, it right. seems. It so seems so pretty. let let me float this question, this idea, rather than you know when we think about these merging, whether again it's teams, departments, or organizations rather than kind of sitting down and hashing it well and and for a really simplistic example say you've got That's a list of values need to be simplistic yeah yeah we've we've got these list of values and rather than sort of picking and choosing well yeah let's we'll pull that value from yours and and then i think we should have this value from ours what about the idea of cleaning the slate totally and just saying let's create something absolutely brand new from yeah. scratch. What do you think of that? Or at least, Mike, at least, I was thinking at least compromise. So you may be the bigger one in the in this in this happening, but and say this is the way we do things, but instead it's a compromise of hey, where where's the gap in our cultures? How do we how do we fill that gap? And how do we, like you say, maybe create something completely different and more exciting? Well, yeah, I think I, if everybody so, comes in with that mindset, what can we learn from you? Yeah, what can right. we learn yes. from each other? Yeah, let's not reinvent the wheel. That's why I'm saying don't start. Let's don't, let's don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's you know keep some of the bathwater, and let let's learn what what are the good things and and what are the things that did not work so well. And I think the biggest question becomes, what's the purpose? Because if it's, for example, to serve the customer, right? Then you kind of go, okay, if our culture is to yell at the customer and your culture is to dance with the customer. Well, from that perspective, we have a more obvious solution. Whereas just because you're the bigger numbers and this is the way you've done it, you know, it, that that's not the, the the healthiest framework. The, the healthy framework kind of goes, what's the big goal? Again, because the goal could be increasing business. It could be bottom line. It could be corporate social responsibility. It could be environmental sustainability. It could be improving organizational culture. I don't care what the goal is. If you have a common uh, understanding of what that desired result is, then 
which culture you adapt and the practices you do moving forward mm -hmm. become more obvious. Yeah, well, yeah, but well I, said, I subject. Argue... Don't you think it would be helpful to, to sorry, Richard, I didn't, didn't mean to cut you off, um, but I will anyways, because I'm already here now. Um, so I, then you, I guess you did mean to cut him off. Yeah, I, I, I kind of did. Okay. Um, but <laughs> now I've lost my train. I love you guys. <laughs> I know. No, no, no. I was gonna say. I was gonna say this. I've got it. Just, just, ah, um, um, um. It, it would be helpful. I'm guessing if everyone could be brutally honest, right? Which we sometimes aren't. And and what I'm what I'm getting at is being brutally honest, saying, you know, here's what we were not doing very well in our culture. Here's where we kind of sucked at in our culture. Here were some of our challenges. How how do you, did you, how do you deal with these issues, these challenges? And if if all the parties are coming from that that mm -hmm. attitude, that perspective, I think that's going to be helpful. It also, you know, you park the ego. So if you have that self-reflection piece and assume that the idea of coming together in whatever capacity is how do we make each other better? Mm -hmm. So I know I, that I think you're I think what you guys are painting is wonderful and amazing. I think it's also a pretty heavy lift for realistically for most organizations and for most people who are running organizations, because and you use the word ego, uh, Sanjay, it's awfully hard, I think, for people to to let that go. I, I've, I've been thinking through this. I mean, so often you would have an organization whose culture worked perfectly well for them merging with another organization whose culture was very different and it worked perfectly well for them. And, and so I think bringing those together and knowing that you're going to have to blend that in some way, I think you're going to have some, some people digging their heels in pretty hard on both sides. Hey, our culture works. I don't know what the problem is. There's also an, it just doesn't go together. There's also an evolutionary piece on this. So for example, if, you know, Jeff and I start a, a business in our garage and, you know, we hiring our buddies and we're making our widgets and we're an entrepreneurial group and we have a certain culture. But if we all of a sudden grow to 100 employees, that same culture doesn't work. And so we have to be able to evolve with with, you know, with the growth. And sometimes that growth is one hire at a time. Sometimes it's a hiring spree and it's 30 people and other times it's through uh, acquisition. So in this, in, in this scenario, am I the CEO or <laughs> I, I would be the janitor? Um, okay. So I, I actually, let me, let me ask it. I'm going to flip the script a bit here. So we've been kind of talking about primarily from a merger and acquisition standpoint. Yeah, let's, let me ask you this way. Individual. Yeah. You're an individual and you've just been hired into a new organization and either you love the culture, or you hate the culture. How do you deal with that as a brand new, the new, the new kid on the block? I, I want to know just what the culture ask that is. Question, Sanjay, thank you. Yeah. I want to know what the culture is before I accept the job. Yeah. Is, I think the other I, I question think most like, people I think most people do that's one of the things that I talk about when I'm talking about recruiting is if if I don't know much about your company how am I going to learn about your culture right. one way is through your website and it better do a pretty darn good job of marketing your culture not just we've got this list of jobs opening uh and so forth. well and and Richard marketing your culture promoting your in an honest way right yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Being honest, because what you're not you're yeah. you, you're trying to fool Everybody people that you're hiring. Well, they're going to find out pretty darn quick that you plus, don't live up to the. Plus, you can ask. You can ask for for you know. Is there somebody? Are there people I can talk to who yeah. maybe somebody who's only been there a year, somebody who's been there a long time, you know? Yeah. And they're still only going to give you good, you know, that the people who they're pretty sure are going to give you a good sure. review. But you can if you ask the right kinds of questions to those people, I think you can dig a little deeper yeah. and find out the culture. And that, well, and I that's guess, that's why in hiring, in effective hiring practices, it should be a conversation where you're spending as much time talking about your company, your culture, your values, what you are all about, mm -hmm. because the last thing you want to do as an employer is hire somebody who's who's not going to be a fit, who's yeah. going to think we're away. Exactly, and it doesn't. It's not, it's not a value works. judgment. It's not to say yeah. that one culture is bad and another is good. An no. example that I know of is. Uh, in, in the IT world, um, I know of, of a company and their IT department is is very collegial and it's uh, but it is hierarchic hierarchically. I think that's a word. It's yeah. set up as a hierarchy. Okay, it's someone who comes from a company like IBM that is very much a matrix culture. I, there's nothing wrong. It works fine for IBM. The hierarchy works fine for this other company. But if you get that that IBM person coming into the other company, 
and they say, well, you know, I'm I'm used to working in a matrix uh, organization, and so um, I can get influence and I can kind of give direction to people all across, and we don't have to have all of this. That's going to just fall over, you know, flat on well, its there. Yeah, but I think if you manage that, if you know that going in, and you say, okay, that's how we did it at IBM. I I don't work for IBM anymore. I work for ABC. And, and if you have those conversations, but then I think also the hiring manager at ABC needs to be, you know, kind of go into it with eyes wide open and, you know, another eye joke. Yeah. But to go in it with eyes wide open and say, let's just, let's be honest here. You've come from this culture. That's not how we are here. We're not likely to change for you. And so can you really change for us? So let's talk about that because it would be important to know that ahead of time. Um, it's just so you said, you know, they, they were working in the matrix. Um, do they know Neo? Yeah, they might. Yeah. I knew you were going to go there. I knew yeah. it. Well, and, and so, on that point, on that point, Richard, too, we, we can't even assume that just because you have a positive, fun culture, that that is for everyone. I remember years ago when I was I was doing research and hanging out at Zappos for a few days where they told me, you know, that they were known for this incredibly fun, family focused, positive great culture where you think oh my god everybody would want to work here but they would say no in a lot of cases people would go yeah not for me yeah. like yeah, yeah a little too fun <laughs> yeah. and that's again it's all about assessing fit that's the whole purpose of a job interview it's assessing the employer's assessing fit to hire you but at the same time just as important you've got to be assessing fit that this is the place i want to i want to hang out with because if you think about how much time you're spending there whether it's at work or in person or whatever so yeah, it's the same thing with the culture. It's not that cultures are good or bad. There are, there's nothing wrong. I've I think there's that. sometimes they are, <laughs> but it, that doesn't necessarily mean it, that, that wrong, you have to have a bad and a good to have a problem. But yeah, exactly, right? So you can have a bad culture, but there's still a good fit for people. There are people who don't want to make eye contact. They want to go do their job and turn off their brain at four o'clock and go home and play with their kids. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as everyone's on the same page. The problem is if you have that mindset, but the expectation is you join the bowling league on Tuesday and the softball team on Wednesday and the karaoke on Thursday, and you're burnt out because you don't want to do that, then you have a clash. And yeah. you know well, how do you deal with that clash? Yeah. I want to circle back to Sanjay's point about the individual level. So, let, so let's bring this down with maybe some tips. Say you do arrive, in a new in a new team and maybe it's even internally so you've you've transferred over to another team within your organization and you know and it's almost killing you inside because you had this great culture you had these great practices best practices that you were doing in your other team that you want your new team to adopt what's the best approach for getting your message across for getting your ideas across well first of all you wouldn't start by saying well over at the north side branch, <laughs> at the north side, we did this. No, I, I think, I think you have to be really careful. You have to tread softly. You have to. It's any. It's like any kind of thing that you're trying to sell an idea. You need to. You need to lead with benefits, yeah. not necessarily features. And say, oh, I, you know, I let me just let's offer. Let me offer this thought that if if we do it this way, you don't need to say because we did it that way. If we do it this way, we might see this benefit let's well, let's give it a try i actually talk about a creative process that i think is okay and you I, would I, yeah i've prom I promoted it before so this is unabashed self-promotion but um and it works that's the fun part and that is first of all asking what effect questions you know what effect does not doing this have on our, our culture what effect will it have on the customer what effect and then the follow-up question is what if well then what if we could and that opens a dialogue. And I think that that dialogue is crucial to what you're saying, Mike, that people have to feel like it was their idea or at least our idea, not your idea. No. And, and I think that, it, but it's sequential. You can't just go to, many companies just go to what if it, and I'm, I'm new in the company or the team and I'm thinking you had a solution and all you did was just put what if in front of it. <laughs> Instead, it's, you know, first of all, what effect? What effect. And, and let's solve it by what if we could so it, very simple process but it works because don't don't you think that people feel really personally uh invested in and, and attached to certain ways of doing things and sure. they will feel threatened sure. if you don't take an approach that's a little bit more collaborative yeah right 
Other thing I would suggest is you do your research. So say you end up in this new environment and you're like, this sucks, I hate it. Before you start jumping in and doing any approach, kind of learn the dynamics because maybe, I don't know, and I'm just being hypothetical, what if uh, the new manager in this department looks up to the manager of your old department and you have that dynamic and you can go to your old manager and go, hey, look at their culture sucks. What do you, how do you feel about having a conversation with them? That might be a really effective way. Or maybe they have an open door policy and there's a communication and they're really open to it or the opposite. You know, it's, it's shut down. It's like, oh my goodness, if you say the wrong thing, you get beaten with the meter stick and uh, et cetera. So I think learning the dynamic before you kind of rock the apple cart, toss the apple cart, what's the expression? We are really mixing metaphors here, especially know, when you whatever. said the meter stick. Upset the orange bag. That's the yardstick for the rest of us. Uh, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to nap. You guys all suck. Rock, <laughs> rock the boat. There you go. Hey, look, Carol, the uh, apple both said one. rock the boat at the same time. What's the apple cart Just one? proving once and for all that great minds think alike. What's the apple cart? Don't upset the apple cart. There you go. Upset the apple cart. Right. Good Lord. <laughs> Brit says, remember the law of diffusion. I don't need everyone to join me in something new or different. I just need to be brave enough to get 15 to 20 percent of the people to join me and the rest will typically follow. Yeah, it's the uh, th there's a YouTube there that what's called the the, the first follower. Yeah, well, that's I love that. Yeah, <laughs> great. By the way, I highly recommend that. I just watched it again after many years. It's very old, but is it, it really color? proves a point. Yeah, is but we're all color? very old, too. So or, is, so. or is it in black and white like Jeff's office? Uh, <laughs> it's black and white. <laughs> Look, I, remember, I had, I had I a yellow it. flower. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I love the truth. I love the, app, the apples. The, the I, I'm sure you guys have all seen water. this, right? Where you've ever stayed at a motel where it advertised color TV or cable oh, TV. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's... And, and where I live, it used to, and you don't even see this anymore, but like in the 1980s, you would see air-conditioned. You knew if it said air-conditioned, don't stay there. <laughs> Because, I mean, you would assume it would be. Okay. Um, so the we're starting to get close to uh, to our uh, closing time. And so I'm thinking about what if you are a manager and you have hired someone because they had all the right qualifications and all the right experience and so forth. And when they get there, you discover, uh-oh, we have a culture clash here. You have hired them. You've brought them on in good faith. They joined you in good faith. And yet you see you have a culture clash, not a performance clash. What do you do? Tranquilizers. <laughs> well, first of all, you revisit your hiring practices to make yeah, sure you, you are hiring for culture. <laughs> right. Right. And don't make that mistake again. Right. That's right. And you do one of these. <laughs> well, yeah. but here's the thing is, if you hired this person, I'm going to assume, I hope, that there's been communication along the way which means you can actually sit down and have a conversation. This person's not a stranger. And yeah. in the conversation, it's a difficult one, but it has to be had. And it says, look at when we were going through this process, here's what I thought I'd laid out. Here's what the expectation were. And here's what I'm seeing. And I feel there's a gap. Can we close that gap? Yeah. And if we can, like how that. are we going to do that? And if not, when are you leaving? <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's, it's not just hiring practices though, right? Right. Because ideally, this person would have been onboarded properly and had the proper training and mentoring early on. But you're you're to, painting to, a, a perfect world picture. To, to, well, what about yes, if it's but not this is but this is what we need to do and and, and immerse them in our culture and do regular check ins and put culture front and center. But I mean, you I know, guess to get to the heart, of, of, assuming none of that happened, Richard, then as Sanjay said, you've got to, you've got to have these serious one-on-one -on -one conversations, explain the importance of your culture, why your values matter, how they were derived, and what your expectations are, and how your values are non-negotiable. Yeah. And Mike, I saw a great example of this with a client that I recently worked with, and I thought it was brilliant. Instead of the leader doing that, because it, it often seems like I just started and already I'm called to the principal's office, they had somebody on the team who was at the same level as the person they hired who did buy into the culture and the, the leader felt like they know our culture. They had them uh, go, you know, go out to lunch or I'm not sure what they did, but they did something with that person. That, and that's where the conversation was at that level versus you know, this level. <laughs> so I, I thought that the concept is, is brilliant. And I think then taking it a step further, and somebody you trust on your team having that conversation. I, I love that, Jeff. That's on page 67 of my book, Hire Inspire and Fuel Their Fire. And keep going. You have an encyclopedic recall. Do, of the I don't know if it's I on think it's amazing. <laughs> you know, again, our chat, the, the chat 
community never lets us down. And right. uh, we're seeing things from Fritz, like I might listen to what's causing the rub. Um, for, I, I love what, what Rob said, uh, using the bus analogy, you know, uh, invite them to take a, a seat on the bus. And if they don't work, politely encourage them to get off at the next stop. What's, what's, <laughs> what's that old book, Walk Softly with a Big Stick? Right. <laughs> Carry a big stick, not with... That was that was Theodore Roosevelt, but that requires a whole history lesson. So we're not going to go right. into it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Ask them to change their culture, according to Bob. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, if if culture is defined as the personality of an organization, I think we have to say an organization has a personality. Clearly, people have personalities. Not everyone has one. I've known some who didn't, but most people do. And you know, if if they don't, if they don't fit, it just doesn't work. I have so many times I've had people say, you know, I hired someone because they had all the right qualifications. I terminated them because it wasn't a, a good culture fit. And it is much less common to see that the other way around. We brought in somebody, great culture fit, but, you know, they just couldn't do the job. I mean, that happens, but I think it's far less often than the other way around. And, and generally speaking, when people have the ability and the mobility and flexibility and malleability to fit in the culture, they're willing to learn. A lot of abilities. I know. And, and they, have a, they have the ability to learn. So <laughs> that's the, uh, and then that's, the thing is, is, Large, smart organizations will always take on talent even when they don't need them. Yeah. Even if they don't have a spot for them because they go, we know if someone becomes available and they are going to be they're a good fit, eventually they're going to they're going to help us uh, in one way or another, even if it's just by being a mentor or by sharing their experiences. It doesn't always have to be technically, uh, you know, technical expertise. In fact, I think, I think what happens is we compromise because of their skills. So we often say you make oh, up isn't that the truth. Yeah, we'll accept them. Yeah, yeah. yeah and and hey guys on the team. We'll put up with the fact that they're a jerk. Yeah. Yeah. The rest of the team, you got to understand, this is the most brilliant scientist, you know, we've ever brought on. We need to put up with some of his, his bull. And, yeah. But but then we sensationalize it. Like what, what we're saying, this reminds me of the show House Doctor, yeah. you know, and the guy was a jerk, but he was brilliant. So we put up with it. We put and up with it. Yeah. The more we sensationalize it and and, ex, and accept it, the more will people will continue to do it. I yeah, don't know. If it's it, right it's also, you know, it goes back to values, and that's not our values. You know, we're not promoting our values when yeah. that happens. Yeah. And and, and I think it, it is about... getting better though, right? You 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 read more and more of organizations that are that there's are more awareness i think la la laying down the law and saying we you know we are a jerk free workplace we we have a there's the big financial um did you get another book title in there company. before we I did I, I i know i've got to i've got i got i got to get the third is one is that because there. they have the humor advantage going for them yeah exactly yes <laughs> they're laughing all the way to the bank creates, by not hiring all kind of contented cows so yeah. uh, along the same lines like and some people call it so i i play in this poker tournament in, in Waterloo, Ontario, they have a the Waterloo Poker Classic. They do run it three or four times a year, and they have one rule. And it's a very fun, laid back tournament. But their one rule is no assholes allowed. And 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 they actually create the experience by yeah. by because some people go to tournaments and they're all like macho and this and that, but they're very laid back. And the more people can call it out, the more uh, the more people will accept that and go, oh, okay, this is the accepted practice. I'm buying in. And I love Carol's question, how, do you, have a, how do you have a jerk-free country? Yeah, Carol, yeah. figure it that out. It starts with out. leadership. Carol, it's a leadership issue. Sanjay, did I ever tell you my dad used to say, "If you, there's always a sucker at every every poker game? Yeah. If, I don't if think you your dad's first you can't, to say it. I know, but if you can't find them, it's you, right? <laughs> I've always remembered that. So, Well, guys, we're wrapping up. Any yeah. other any kind of final comments before we talk about the next show? Well, I've, I've heard a... a steady drumbeat of a theme that it comes down to really having sometimes difficult but open and frank conversations being aware that culture matters it matters with a capital m a lot more than we used to think it did and boy if we don't get that right then whether we're merging organizations or uh, you know merging people bringing them in or joining another team and so forth it's almost certain to be doomed to failure if we don't yeah. address the culture part i, I well think said, it I think it makes it easier to hire people, to merge, to bring in other people when you know your culture. Yeah, you when you're really it. aware of what it is. You know what and that's why we're you know here. Yeah. That's why we're here how, how often, Richard? Every other Wednesday. Yes, we are. <laughs> so, and when is our next uh, 
Mark, Every, I, I happen to know that because I looked it up and it is, March go ahead and say it. March 6th. Do you know this is how you say six in sign language? I didn't know that. At one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So March 6th. Okay. March 6th, 2024. And we'll have hey, another Sanjay, I, Okay. I, I have to, I have to. I have to ask Sanjay now if he knows this joke before we leave. Do you, uh -oh. can can you say all the digits in pi? All the digits in pi. Yeah. Um, I don't know the joke, but I know three four one four one five nine two six five three five nine. Zero one two three four five six seven eight nine. There are no others. Good call. Oh, friends. Hey, it's, it's, not, it's not a joke. It's a riddle. <laughs> if you'd said riddle, I would. It's a riddle. Uh, riddle <laughs> slash joke. Guys, it was a great, and okay, as Rob great. says to end things, it was a great conversation today. It always yeah. is. And on that note, says Brian. It's right. And yeah. we will see everybody every other Wednesday on March the 6th. Thanks, right. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Cheers, bye.